In this video, we'll look at two simple methods for training a policy network, random search and policy gradients. Here's the picture we outlined in the previous video. Reinforcement learning consists of an environment that tells us which state we're currently in and what reward we've earned for entering that state, and a learner that trains a policy which maps the current state to an action. A very simple way of solving the reinforcement learning problem is by not worrying about gradients and using black box optimization methods like random search. Here's how random search was defined in the second lecture. We start with a random point m in the model space, we enter a loop, we pick another point m prime close to the first, and if this new point has a lower loss than the old, then we switch to the new point, otherwise we stick with the one we had. And doing that, Step by step, we can get closer and closer to parts of the model space that have low loss. And if we're doing episodic learning, then this kind of search method can be directly applied. We start with a model, we execute it for a few episodes and observe its average reward. We take that as our objective function and we apply random search to maximize the reward. To see how that works in practice, let's look at the example of playing tic-tac-toe. And we'll return to this example for every algorithm we introduce. As we saw before, the actions in this case are the moves we can make, the environment consists largely of the opponent, and after we make a move, we observe the new state of the board after the opponent has made their move, and the reward is 1 if that state is 1 in which we have won, minus 1 if that state is 1 in which we have lost, and 0 otherwise. So note that we only get a reward at the end of the game. How much each intermediate state is worth to us is up to us to figure out. The first thing we need to decide on is what the environment will be. To keep things simple, we'll assume that we have some fixed opponent that we are going to try to beat. This could be some algorithmic player we've built based on simple rules, or if we don't have any such algorithm available, we could just start with an opponent that plays random moves, train a policy network that beats that player, and iterate. We make our trained network the new opponent and train a new network to beat it, and so on. If we do this sort of thing, it's often good to maintain a pool of opponents and to sample one at random for each episode, so that the network doesn't overfit to beating one opponent, but maintains a good general strategy. The episodes that we'll use to train our policy network will be single games against an opponent. We will play these by sampling actions from the output distribution that the network provides for the current state. The state, as we said before, is simply the playing board at a particular moment in time, and an action is placing a cross or a circle anywhere on the board where there isn't one already. Our policy is a neural network, and it outputs probabilities over the nine possible actions. So if we have a state like this, we represent it as a 3 by 3 matrix containing zeros for empty squares, minus ones for squares occupied by the opponent, and ones for squares that we occupy. We can either flatten this matrix into a vector and feed it to a fully connected network, or keep it a two tensor and feed it to a convolutional neural net. The output layer of the network also contains nine units that represents the squares of the board, and we apply a softmax activation to the output layer and interpret the resulting probabilities as a probabilistic policy. The probability on the first output node is the probability that will place a cross in the top left corner square. And we needn't worry about forcing the neural networks not to make illegal moves, like placing a cross where there already is a symbol, because if we simply ensure that an illegal move always results in an instant loss of the game, then it's very likely that the neural network will simply learn not to place crosses in those squares. In short, we don't hard code the rules of the game, we let the network learn the rules. With that, that's what random search looks like. We set up our network with some weights, we gather up all the weights of the policy network into a vector p, and we call that our current model. We run a few episodes, that is, games against the opponents, and we see how many of these it wins. More precisely, what its average reward is over all the episodes. We then apply a small perturbation to p, like some random noise, and call the resulting policy p prime, which is another policy network. We check the average reward for p prime as well. And if it's higher than that for p, we call p prime the new model p. If it isn't higher, we discard p prime and keep p as the current model. We iterate for as long as we have patience, and we see if the resulting model is any good. And in some cases, it is. For some games, 
like Frostbite, which is one of the Atari games, a model trained by random search does exceedingly well. And remember that the Atari challenge is from pixels. That means that we're looking at a convolutional neural network that was trained not by gradient descent, but by random search. So sometimes random search works very well, but not always. And when it doesn't, we can get a big boost in power from applying backpropagation where we can. As we noted in the previous video, we cannot backpropagate through the whole of this unrolled computation graph, but for parts of it we can, from the output of the network back to the input, we can apply backpropagation. Policy gradient descent is a simple method that allows us to estimate a gradient for the parts of our computation where we cannot compute the gradient explicitly. And it's a very simple idea. We run an episode, we compute the total reward, which is positive if the episode ended well and negative if the episode ended badly, and we simply apply that backwards over all the states of the episode. If we had a high reward at the end, we compute the gradient for a high value and follow that, and if we had a low reward, then we compute the gradient for a low value and follow that. This essentially completely ignores what we said earlier about credit assignment. Many of the actions that led to a bad outcome may in fact have been good actions, and only one of these is the cause of the disaster. In policy gradient descent, we simply don't care. If the episode ended badly, we punish the network blindly for all of its actions, good or bad. The idea is that if some of these actions that we end up punishing the network for are good, then on average, they will occur more often in episodes ending with a positive reward than they do in episodes ending with a negative reward. And on average, they will be labeled good more often than bad. We let the averaging effect over many episodes take care of the credit assignment problem for us. In the example of a car crash, we should make sure that the agent investigates the sequences where it doesn't break before a crash as well, preferably in a simulated environment, because then averaging over all sequences, including breaking before the crash and not breaking before the crash, we will see that breaking results in less damage than not breaking, so the agent will eventually learn that breaking is a good idea. Here's what that looks like for an episode with a policy network. We compute the actions from the state. At each step, we sample an action and observe a reward and a new state, and we keep going until the episode ends, and then we look at the total reward. In this case, we get a total reward out of this episode of three steps of one. Now the question is, how exactly do we apply the reward backwards to each instance of the policy network? Once we have a loss for each of these three instances of the network, we can backpropagate based on the values from the forward pass. But is it best to just backpropagate the reward, or should we scale it somehow? How should it interact with the different probabilities that the network produced for the actions? If we sample the low probability action, should we apply less of the reward? Do we backpropagate only from the node corresponding to the action we chose, or from all output nodes? All of these approaches may or may not work. And as we've seen in the past, when we have a lot of open questions, it can help to derive an intuitive approach more formally to help us make some of these decisions. Luckily, such a formal derivation exists for policy gradients, and it's relatively simple. We'll look at one single action A, that was taken at some point during the episode. We call R, the final reward at the end of the episode, as a function of A. So depending on which action A we pick, we will observe a different total reward at the end of the episode. And we're ignoring the influence of all the other actions we also have to take, taking those as constants. Our network produces probabilities from which we sample. So this final reward is actually a partially random value. Two episodes with the same initial state may lead to different total rewards due to different actions sampled. The expectation of that reward is what we're really interested in maximizing. And since we're applying gradient descent, we want to work out the gradient of the quantity that we're maximizing. So this is what we're looking for. The gradient of the expectation of the total loss under our choice of A. We start by writing out the gradient explicitly, which is a weighted sum over the different rewards for the different actions, weighted by the probability that the neural network assigns to all of these actions. So here the function p of a is the probability that our neural network assigns to the action a, and this function p a essentially contains the parameters that we want to learn. We are free to move the derivative inside the sum, and the next step is to multiply 
by PA over PA. This gives us a factor in the middle, which we can recognize as the derivative of the natural logarithm. 1 over something times the derivative of something is the derivative of the logarithm of something. So we replace this factor in the middle by the derivative of the logarithm of p. We can then rewrite, moving r to the left, and turning the sum back into an expectation. And what we've shown is that the derivative of the expected reward is the expectation of the reward times the derivative of the probability of the action. And this expectation, in contrast to the expectation at the start, is one that we can estimate by Monte Carlo sampling. We simply sample a bunch of trajectories and average this quantity inside the expectation for all of our k samples. The rewards for each of these samples we can simply observe. And this value here, the derivative of the logarithm of the probability of the action, we can work out by backpropagation. So here's what that looks like. To simplify things, we will approximate the expectation with a single sample. So we're setting k in the previous slide equal to 1. And here we will only look at the gradient for the first instance of a policy network. We can imagine that our network outputs three actions, for instance, left, straight, and right. During the episode, we sample the action straight, we complete the episode, and we observe a total reward of 1. If we now look at the derivative of a single weight w of our neural network, and we apply what we learned in the previous slide, we see that its gradient is approximated by 1 times a derivative, and this derivative we can work out by backpropagation. Let's see what that looks like for our tic-tac-toe example. We model it in the same way and with the same policy network as we did with the random search, but this time, but this time we'll look at how to train it using policy gradients. We start with some network and we execute one episode, one game of tic-tac-toe until somebody has won. At each state, we feed the board to the neural network, which gives us a probability distribution on the actions. We sample an action, we feed that to the environment, which gives us the state after the opponent has made his move and gives us the reward for this new state. And here we see that after three moves, we have lost the game. Note that the probabilities are actually relatively sound in this case, but it just so happened, but it just so happened that for our third move, an action was sampled that we gave a relatively low probability. So what we want the network to learn here is that in this third move, that probability should be even lower. We look at our final reward, which is minus one, and we use it to set up three losses for each three instances of our policy network, which we can then backpropagate. So that's policy gradients. We train an episode, and while we run the episode, we save all of the instances of the policy network that were used to choose an action. At the end of the episode, we observe a total reward, and we distribute this total reward back to all the instances in the episode, which can then be backpropagated down the network. Two final things to note. A very good property of policy gradients is that the gradient estimates that we get are unbiased. If we sample enough of them, we can be sure that we converge to the correct gradient. But unfortunately, the variance of our estimate is usually very high. There are many methods to reduce the variance, with names such as control variates or actor critic, and these are usually necessary to employ if you want to apply policy gradients in any realistic setting. So with that, we've seen two ways of attacking a reinforcement learning problem, random search and policy gradients. Let's look back at our four problems of reinforcement learning and see which of them these solve, or solve at least in part. We have a solution to some extent for the sparse loss, the credit assignment, and the non-differentiable loss. We may need many episodes for the effects to average out properly, but in principle, it's the start of a solution to all of these three problems. It's important to note, however, that we haven't solved the exploration versus exploitation problem. Whether we're using random search or policy gradient descent, if we always follow our current best policy when we're executing episodes, then we are still very likely to be seduced by early successes and end up just repeating a known formula for a quick and low reward, rather than finding a more complex path towards a higher reward. Put simply, we can very quickly get stuck in local minima. The optimal trade-off between exploration and exploitation is not easy to define, 
and in some sense it's a subjective choice. How much immediate gain are we willing to trade off against long-term gain? Nevertheless, there are simple ways to at least give yourself some control over the behavior of your learner. One trick is Boltzmann exploration. Instead of sampling from the normal softmax output, we introduce a new softmax with a temperature parameter, which consists of a positive value t, by which we simply divide all the values of the input vector x before we exponentiate and normalize. If we set this to a high value, such as 100, then no matter what the input, the resulting distribution will be fairly uniform. If we set it to a medium temperature, like 1, we recover the original softmax. And if we set it to a low temperature, somewhere between 0 and 1, then this softmax with temperature will exaggerate the differences in the distribution. So this means that if we apply this kind of softmax to the output distribution of our policy network, if we set the temperature high, the network will be more likely to explore. And the actions that we don't think are very good are more likely to be sampled. If we set the temperature very low, then the policy network is more likely to exploit and to pick only the action to which we've assigned the highest probability. Another approach is called epsilon greedy sampling. Here we set a hyperparameter epsilon and we pick a random number. And if that random number is lower than epsilon, so with probability epsilon, we pick one of the actions at random from a uniform distribution over all the actions. Otherwise, we simply choose greedily. We pick the action with the highest probability without sampling at all. So that's it for random search and policy gradients. In the next video, we'll look at one more algorithm for solving the reinforcement learning problem, deep Q-learning.